anything? It's live. Yeah. Hey, try this. See if you hear anything come through. Okay, but the problem is it's now picking us up. It should only pick up sound from the mic, not us. Turn it down, then. See what it sounds like through there. Can you hear me, Nathan? What does it sound like when you're out in the foyer?
Ya. Halo, halo, halo. So you have to have that on for it to come through.
one. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good evening. My name is Wilma Pete. I'm the Native American um, Education Coordinator here for the school district. And tonight, um, with collaboration from Tammy, Pete, who's our instructional aide for the school district, we have gotten our special guest to come and talk to our community. Um, and then I'm going to hand this over to Tammy because she knows a little bit more about, um, about Mr. Peter McDonald. Yat A, my name is Tammy P. in Shea, Tachit Ni Nato, the Net Initially. My day is Gizni Bushes Teen, Tachit Ni Nanastasia, Dasha Che, my day is Gizni Dasha Nella. Good evening, Snowflake. This is, it's an honor to have this guy here, Mr. Peter McDonald. He's a World War II veteran, he's a Navajo co talker. Um, he's 93 now, sir. Oh, he's hard of hearing. He's 93. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand the mic over to him, and I'll let him talk to you and let you let him tell you his story. No. Can I start now? Yeah, you can start now. Oh, oh. Okay, this is the group you're good. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there'll probably be more people coming, so just go ahead and start. You can start. Thank you very much for the introduction, and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very happy to be here this evening. I have my lovely wife with me here, Wanda. She's sitting out there somewhere. Anyway, she's here. Also, I have my youngest daughter, Charity, who uh, have been very, very helpful uh, pushing me around into my wheelchair. Actually, it was not until about this year that I couldn't walk, even though I like to walk, but it's, it's painful to walk, so uh, back to the wheelchair. Anyway, those Navajos who are here, she she has led her at that she came, cared a hat in. Today, a ya to the city, Toninest this day, Adi Setta. I just mentioned that my clan, also where I was originally from. Four Corners area, Tisnas Pass, Arizona. And, but today we live in Tuba City, Arizona. And Tuba is the area where my wife, her mother, and her relatives all grew up there in Tuba City. and. Navajo Mountain in that area. It's just like the old tradition. When you get married, you go to your in-laws place. You leave your home. So that's why I'm several, probably about close to 300 miles away from where I was born and raised and where all my relatives are. Back in the old tradition, that it was the custom. They take you to your new bride's place. It may be 10, 15, 20 miles away. And 
to lecture you all night long how to have a good lasting marriage and then your family goes back to their home and they leave you there at the home of your bride. And that's sort of how it is with me. I was born and raised Tees, but I'm over where my wife and her family were raised. I really couldn't understand why that was the system until later on. What happened really is that your new location with the in-laws, the in-laws actually figured they got a new slave. <laughs> You're supposed to do so many things in competition with the other in-law that they brought. So the two or three of you are competing against each other to see which in-law is the best. <laughs> So that was the system, of course. We don't have that anymore. <clears throat> you know, I drive through here quite a few times. My wife and I actually spent uh, one whole week up, up on uh, uh, near uh, the Apache country. And uh, we, this place always, uh makes me feel like it's a it's a real nice clean town it's uh when you drive through here you could see it. nice wide streets and also clean environment everywhere and that's very very good probably one of the best well-kept city in the America Southwest, Snowflake. And I commend all of you for living here and keeping that up. Well, first of all, I guess we all have to thank William Flake and Mr. Snow, who I understand got together about 150 years ago when there was no homes there except maybe a lot of livestock. And they decided to form a town, Snowflake. Mr. Snow and William Flake together. So you folks are still carrying on that tradition. It's a beautiful country. You've got a lot of resources here. I commend you for maintaining it in such a good way. Also, there's quite a few Native Americans in here, in this area. You are not too far from here. You got the Apaches. You also have quite a few Navajos and Hopis living in this area, I'm sure. So we're all together to make life even more enjoyable. And uh, understand, today we got two, two ho holiday or recognition day. I think some people call today Columbus Day. And then another group call it indigenous People Day. I really couldn't figure out what indigenous mean, so I look it up in a dictionary. It turns out it means someone who, who have been there and raised in that area from time immemorial. So I guess indigenous is supposed to refer to uh, Native Americans. So whether you're celebrating Columbus Day or Indigenous Day, happy holiday to all of you. <clears throat>
You know, how many of you have heard of Navajo code talkers? Uh, quite a few of you. Thank you. You know, that, that's a real long story. And uh, I don't know how much time you have, but I'll try to give you that story in the briefest form I can. You know, uh, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States was getting ready to fight back in the Pacific. Not too long, the Allied forces in the Pacific, Navy, Army, Air Force, and Marines, were all trying to get ready to fight back after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Well, not too long, they ran into one big problem. The problem was communication. They tell us that in every war, no matter how far back you go in history, the site that has the best communication normally has the advantage in the war. Well, in our case, after Pearl Harbor, the Allied forces in the Pacific discovered that the enemy was breaking every military code that was being used in the Pacific. Why do you need a military code? Because you want to communicate your strategic movement without the enemy knowing what your plans are. So military codes are used to communicate with your own unit as to what the next move is going to be. And the enemy would not know. Of course, back in 1941, 42, the only way to communicate long distance was by radio. We all know how radio works. We all have radio in our cars. You dial to one frequency and it's just some radio station. You don't like it, you dial it to another one. You don't like it, you go to several stations where different cities broadcast their news or music. That's how radio works. So, the only means of a long distance communication back in 1942 was radio. So Marine would talk to the Navy, Navy would talk to Marines. Marines would communicate with the Army, Air Force. And using military code that they had, but the enemy was breaking every one of those codes that were being used by the United States in the Pacific, making it very, very difficult to strategize because once they break your coat, they'll know what day you left certain location and what route you're taking over the Pacific and what day you're going to be at whatever location you are trying to reach. And besides, Pacific is a huge area. It takes days, sometimes even weeks, to go from point A to point B. 
So the enemy had all that time to break the code. And the enemy, after they break it, will know exactly where you started, what route you're taking, and where you're going to be, what day and what time. And they're going to have their submarine there. When you get there, they blow up your shipment of supplies, equipment, or even personnel. This wasn't good at all. The enemy had tremendous advantage, knowing you might as well just call them up and say, hey, tomorrow we're going to leave San Diego, and now we're going to take such a route. And uh, six days from now, it will be Pearl Harbor. And from Pearl Harbor, we're going to move southwest to a certain island, and we would be there on such and such a day and time. And they'll hang up and say, thank you very much. And they will be waiting for you there, or even in route. The enemy had tremendous advantage over the Allied forces in this huge Pacific area. Like I said, where it takes days to go from point A to point B, maybe even weeks to go from point A to point B. A gentleman by the name of Philip Johnston was working near San Diego. He read in the newspaper in February of 1942, just a few weeks after bombing of Pearl Harbor. He read in that newspaper that the Japanese were breaking all military codes used in the Pacific. So Philip Johnston took time to go visit United States Marine Corps San Diego, talk with the communication officers. Philip Johnston suggested, why not use Navajo language as a code? Because the enemy doesn't know the Navajo language, he said. Furthermore, maybe only two or three people outside the Navajo nation knows the language. So it's very secure and safe to use the Navajo language as a military code. Well, the communication officers of Marine Corps Base San Diego listened, but they really couldn't understand what this thing's supposed to work. So Philip Johnston, took time to come to the Navajo Nation and picked four Navajos took him, that took them down to San Diego Marine Corps base to demonstrate what he was talking about. They put two Navajos or radio headset on one end of the building, the other two on the other. And they created a few code words between the <clears throat> four of them, and they gave a message to the two over here in English. They sent that message in Navajo to the other two on the other end of the building in Navajo. They wrote it down in English. They compared the two messages, the one that was sent, the one that was received, to see how much the two messages look alike. Well, it really didn't look alike, it was similar. But to the Marine, this has some possibilities. So, they asked the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps in Washington, D.C., permission to try this suggestion made by Philip Johnston. Well, 
the Commandant in Washington, D.C. response was, no, don't do that. We don't know these Indians, he said. All we know is what we see in the movies. When they see wagon train, they yell and holler right around their wagon train shooting arrows. This is not that kind of a war, so leave it alone. That was the initial response by the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps in Washington, D.C. He also said, we don't know these Indians could even become United States Marines. Marine Corps is a very proud organization, he said. We don't want anybody wearing United States Marine Corps uniform that might embarrass this proud organization. Leave it alone, just do the best you can. That was February 1942. Philip Johnston, who was Philip Johnston? Philip Johnson was not a Navajo. He was Pelicana, an Anglo person. Philip Johnson's parents, in late 1800, came to the Navajo Nation as missionaries to Navajo. At that time, Philip Johnson was a little boy. So Philip Johnson actually grew up on the Navajo Nation. His parents being missionaries. So Philip Johnson learned to speak Navajo by playing with Navajo kids. Philip Johnson grew up on Navajo. Philip Johnson also served in World War I, 1918. He joined the army, went overseas in Europe, and he also was with the communication unit. So he knows something about communication, Philip Johnston. That's why he was making this suggestion, because he served in the military, World War I, overseas in Europe. And now World War II, he's working near San Diego. And he suggests that why not use Navajo language as a code. Anyway, that was uh, February 1942. The enemy were moving in our direction real fast, taking strategic islands that we need in order to get close to their homeland. It'd be much easier to fight from those islands shorter distance. Well, it wasn't working out that way. The enemy was coming in direction real fast. San Diego Marine Corps base continued to put pressure on the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps in D.C. Eventually, in April of 1942, the Commandant said, okay, I understand that there's a need for a new code in the Pacific because the enemy is moving in our direction real fast, taking strategic islands that we need like Guam, Wake Island, Midway, and other islands this side of Guam. And we need those islands in order to get close to their homeland. So the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, D.C., told San Diego Marine Corps base 
go ahead and try the suggestion made by Philip Johnston. So, in April of 1942, Philip Johnston and three or four Marine Corps recruiters came out here to recruit just 30 young Navajos because the commandant reasoned sure this is going to work at all. So he ordered San Diego Marine Corps base just to recruit 30 young Navajos. And one of his requirements was this project must be a top secret project. No one must know that you are developing a military code using Navajo language. So don't even tell these 30 young Navajos I'm authorizing you to recruit what you're gonna do with them. Just ask them if they want to join Marines and fight the war in the Pacific. And if they say yes, recruit them. Also, go to the Navajo Nation, ask the Navajo Nation leaders that you want to use the Navajo language. That's all. Top secret. No one must know that you are developing a military code using Navajo language. So with that instruction, Marine Corps recruiters and Philip Johnston came out to the Navajo Nation. Of course, BIAs had some boarding schools for Navajos, Tuba City, Shiprock, Fort Defiance, and Fort Wingate. So they went to these boarding schools and they talked to the, those who are at least 18 years old and asked if they want to fight the war in the Pacific. And they all said yes. They also asked, you want to wear this beautiful Marine Corps uniform? They said yes. Okay. You want to join the Marines? Yes. That's it. They also went to Window Rock, asked permission to use the language. That's all. Immediately, they recruited 30 young Navajos. This is in April 1942. These 30 young Navajos were then given a physical exam. One drop out. So there's only 29 Navajos to be used as a test to see if this idea proposed by Philip Johnston is really going to work. So these 29s were then put on a bus in Gallup, New Mexico. They were taken down to San Diego Marine Corps base and they were made into one platoon, 29 young Navajos was a platoon. There were several platoons going through boot camp all at the same time. Graduation from boot camp in May of 1942. These young men going through boot camp were graded. Anglos, platoon and one Navajo platoon. And all of them were graded together. The best platoon would be number one. The next one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Navajo platoon, composed of the 29 young Navajos, came in number one of all platoons that were going through boot camp. <laughs> Thank you. That got back to the Commandant, who had some doubt, obviously. Of course, he was happy. 
He said, terrific, splendid. Now process them through combat training and see what they do. So after boot camp, they were processed through combat training with all other Marines together. Well, Navajo platoon again came in very well. Most of them became experts on weapons that were being used at that time. Sharpshooters on M1 rifle and the carbines, machine guns, many other weapons that were being used at that time. So after combat training, they were then sent to Marine Corps Communication School at Camp Pendleton, Oceanside, California. And that's where Marines have, can go through special training. If you want to be with a tank units, you go to tank school. If you want to be with a artillery unit, you go to artillery school. If you want to be with a communication unit using radios and what have you, you go to a communication school. Well, these 29 young Navajos didn't have that choice. The Commandant ordered Marine Corps base after they finished combat training to process them through communication school. So that's what they did. They went to communication school with all Marines who want to be in the communication. And there, communication school, Camp Pendleton, they teach you how to use different radio equipment that, is being, that was being used at that time. TBX, big gigantic radio, with a generator, they had to crank it to generate power, weighs about 40 pounds. Another guy carries the receiver and transmitter, weighs nearly the same weight. Antennas, wires, so it takes two to operate TBX radio. That was one. You also learned many other things. That's where they taught us Navy semaphore signals. They also taught us how to make minor repairs on most of the communication equipment that was being used at that time. Also, to run telephone lines from coconut trees to coconut trees. You know how coconut tree looks like. It's spared until you get to the very top. There you got some leaves up there. So they give us spurs with spike use that spur to climb up to the top, run the wire, tie it up, and they tell us, enemy sees you running the wire, so you don't want to come down slowly with your spurs. Unhook yourself and fall down straight down before you hit the ground, hook the tree again. Well, it's easy said and done. <laughs> you unhook yourself, you fall like a bullet. Before you could even rehook yourself to the tree, you hit the ground. That's why most of us have bad knees. <laughs> well, these 29 young Navajos, now we're talking uh, at June of 1942. These 29 passed everything. They swear they, like I said, taught you all communication system that was being used at that time. Morse code, Navy semaphore signals, and what have you. How to make minor repairs on the communication equipment that was being used. After that, these 29 young Navajos were then separated from all Marines now. They were put on a bus, and a Marine Corps colonel, a full bird colonel, now took charge of these 29 young Navajos. They got put them on a bus. They rode the bus from Camp Pendleton down to San Diego. 
east side of San Diego, close to Camp Elliott, there was a building about twice the size of this auditorium here with high fence around that building, razor wire on top, and a gate. And over that gate, there's a big sign that said, keep out, top secret operation. There are two guards at the gate with carbine. These 29 young Navajos were processed through that gate by a United States Marine Corps colonel into a classroom, a regular sized classroom. And in that classroom were tables. And around each table were four chairs. In the front of each chair, writing tablet, a pencil. And on a wall, a huge blackboard with chalk and eraser. Colonel, then addressed these 29 young Navajos and told them, gentlemen, you are Marines now. You ready to go fight the war in the Pacific. But before you do that, we'd like for you to do something else first. We'd like for you to develop a military code using your language. Wow, this is the first time they learn, these 29 young Navajos, that they were recruited to develop a military code. What a surprise. I'm sure, I keep thinking if I was one of those 29 back in 1942, I probably would do this to my friend sitting next to me, say, hey buddy, I think we made a mistake here. <laughs> What's this military code business? We joined, I joined to fight the war in the Pacific to shoot the enemy. But, like all good Marines, you have to listen to the officer. So the, colon the colonels explain that this project is top secret. No one knows you in this classroom. No one knows that this building exists. So everything you do in this classroom is top secret. You have writing tablets in front of you. So you could put down the code words that you are developing and memorize it because everything you could be developing in way of code words is got to be subject to memory only. You cannot write it down on your tablet, put it in your pocket, so when you get into battle, you don't want to try to remember what was the code word for this or for that. <laughs> your memory will be the only ones you're gonna use. So at the end of the day, whatever you do in this top secret classroom, pick it up, put it in a locker. Each one of you have a locker. You put it in there, under lock. And at the end of the day, before you go back out that gate, you can be searched from the tip of your toes to the top of your head. Make sure you don't take anything out of this top secret classroom back out that gate to your barracks. And you're not gonna tell anybody out there what you are doing in here. Top secret. Also, whatever code words you're developing, only you know. Another Navajo, not in this top secret classroom, should know what you are doing here, not even your parents or relatives, friends. Don't tell anybody. This is top secret. 
because if the enemy breaks your code, it might cost several thousand lives because you were careless, because you didn't obey what you were told. All code words you develop is top secret and only you would know. As a matter of fact, whatever code words you develop, if another Navajo, not in this top secret classroom, here you use those words, they will have no idea what in the world you're talking about. That's the kind of code we want. A huge lecture about the secrecy and the importance of the code. Colonel then said there's a box full of typical military messages sent in battle. Look at it and see how you can send messages like that using the code words you're gonna be developing. Colonel sat down, lit his pipe and said, gentlemen, go to work. What do you do? Look, I say, look at each other. And they went to the box, start looking at these typical messages sent in combat. And they're all written in English language. Some of them are coded. Code words back in those days came in the groups of five letters, like K, Z, T, I, O, and another group of five letters. They look at all those, and one of them said, hey, we can't do this. Why? Because all of these messages are written in the English language. Use an English alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F. Navajo is not a written language. So we don't have words for A or B or C or D. So how in the world are we going to send something we have no words for? It? So they mentioned that to the colonel. And the colonel then said, you figure it out but you can develop a code. That's why you're here. So one of these 29 young Navajos in June of 1942 now, went to the blackboard and wrote down a big letter A and said, okay, since only we, the 29 of us in this classroom, know what these code words are gonna be, Let's call the letter A, Pelasana. Pelasana in Navajo means apple. They all agreed, okay. They wrote it down on their writing tablet. A equals Pelasana or apple. Okay, what shall we call letter B? After talking about it, they decided to call the letter B, Shush. Shush in Navajo means bear. Okay, how about letter C? They talk about it. Eventually someone said, let's call letter C, Masa. Masa in Navajo means cat. After that, how about letter D? D, after discussing it a while, they decided to call it B. B in Navajo means deer, D-E-E-R. Why, why were they doing it? See, they were told at the beginning, whatever code you develop, it's got to be subject to memory only. You cannot take the, any notes with you into battle. So they were choosing words that they can easily remember. 
Back in those days, almost every family had farm. We had orchards, apple. We eat apple year round. Not just when it's ripe. After it's ripe around September, we peel them, dry them, and the sun put in a big bag, and we have apple all through the winter. How about bee, bear? Where bear is part of our legend. Most of our Navajo stories contain bears, so it's easy to remember. Cat, almost every home had cats. For letter C, for cat, can remember easily. Letter D, B, deer. Back in those days, most family went hunting about two or three times a year for deer. And deer also appears in our legend. So it's easy to remember. All the way down to Z. Code word for the letter Z. Beshtotlish. Beshtotlish in Navajo means zinc. So now they have created Navajo words for each of the letters of the English alphabet. And only they, the 29 in that top secret classroom, know what those Navajo words represent. For instance, if you're in the, a code talker and out in battle and you hear a message coming through that says, Belasana, you're not, think, you're not thinking about something you eat. When you hear Belasana, you write down the letter A. But if another Navajo who didn't go through this top secret class during the creation of these code words. When they hear Belasana, they think we're talking about something you eat, not letter A. So, code words were developed like that. There was another officer inside that top secret classroom. Colonel introduced him to be Marine Corps military code expert. Every code you develop, run it by the code expert. So they did, they ran it by the code expert that they have created these code words for each letters of the English alphabet. The code expert said, that's wonderful. It's good, he said, but you know we have a very smart enemy. They're very intelligent. They can break any code. And, and the English language is such as many of the words have more than one A or one B or one C. That's repetition. The enemy we have are smart. They can use repetition to break a code. He said, like, the word Guadalcanal has four A's in it. So he's going to spell Guadalcanal. You can say, Pelasana, 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 four times. The Indians are going to use that repetition with the space in your head, but before you say the next Pelasana, they can break your coat. Back to the drawing board. What do we do? Well, the only thing to do was to create two additional code words for each letters of the English alphabet. And again, mind you, it's got to be subject to memory only. So they did that. They went back to the code expert and say, we created two additional words. So there's, for each letters of the English alphabet, we have three words. So if you're going to spell Guadalcanal, the, with the ones that have four A's in it, the first A 
Belisana, the second A, Tennis, X, something you chop wood with. The third A and Guadalcanal would be, <coughs> would be uh, Wulachi. Wulachi in Navajo means int, A N T. The fourth A, back to Belasana. Well, the code expert was very happy, he said, that's terrific, that's wonderful, excellent. Yeah, excellent for you. But what that means, we had to memorize that many more code words for each letter of the English alphabet. And we cannot write it down and carry it around with us. Well, developing code words every day in June of 1942, these 29 young Navajos from sunup Thank you. Oh. From sunup to sundown, every day, developing code words for so many things that we Navajos don't even have words for. For instance, they one of these 29 young Navajos was just like me. All they knew was what's on the reservation. They never been out anywhere, not even in a big towns. We didn't know there was an ocean. Never seen it. We didn't even know there's such, such thing as ships. All we know is we have a, a little canoe, tana ek. That's a word for a, a canoe. It's made out of wood. But when we got to San Diego, they take us out to the beach and they show us a huge steel ship with big guns. Then they said, that's a battleship. Then they had another one, a little bit smaller. They said, that's a cruiser. Another little one over here. They said, that's a destroyer. That one way over there, that's an aircraft carrier. Wow, what an education. We've never seen these things before. We don't even have words for them. There's that thing down there, that's a submarine. No Navajo words, because we've never seen them before. It's not even in our legends. So, the challenge is to create code words for them. A battleship was decided to be called so, so big fish. A cruiser, so, so, yazi, little big fish. Aircraft carrier, city ne yehe, the one that carried birds around. <laughs> Submarine, fish, slow. Iron fish. Again, only those of us in the top secret classroom know what those words represent. Another Navajo out here, here not say, so, so. All he knows is that we're talking about some big fish. <laughs> but we, the code talkers, when we hear thoughts so come through the air, we don't write down big fish, we write down battleship. A lot of things that we don't have. For instance, like um, amphibious landing craft. It's like a tractor. It goes in the water, then it can get out on the beach, on the, on the, on the land. we never seen it. There's no never whole words for it. So, code word was developed for landing craft. It was called chas. Chas in Navajo means frog. Why? Because it can operate in water as well as on land. 
So if you say, if Navajo is captured by Japanese and they were listening to our messages, Japanese would ask Navajo, what are they saying? They talk about frogs. <laughs> you know, they talk about something that carry birds around. <laughs> so, the code words that were being developed, only we know what those Navajo words represent. Another Navajo, not in their top secret classroom, knows. Every day, working in June of 1942, toward the end of June 1942, these 29 young Navajos developed over 200 code words memorized. Every week there would be a test. They divide the group into group A and group B. Group A is given a military message containing most of the code words that they memorize, created and memorized. They send that, A, send that message in Navajo code that they develop to group B. They write it down in English. The two messages are compared to see how well the two messages are beginning to look exactly alike, testing our memory. Every week, test. Well, at the end of June 1942, I said over 200 code words were developed and memorized. The uh, colonel said, well, we're going to have a final test here. So the group was divided, group A and group B. Group A is given a long message containing most of the code words that were developed. So it's a long message. They send that long message in Navajo code that they had developed and memorized to group B. Group B wrote it down in English. They compared the two messages, the one that was sent, the one that was received. It was exactly alike with one exception, punctuation marks. <laughs> Back to the classroom <laughs> to create code words for punctuation marks. A period, no problem, that is jin. That is jin in Navajo means a black dot. <laughs> Semicolon took a little time to create code words for it. But eventually it was called Dutlijin a black dot that lost its tail. <laughs> that would be the code word for semicolon. How about question mark? Code word for question mark was Acha. Acha in Navajo means ears, because question mark looks like an ear. All punctuation marks you could think of code words were developed, memorized, back to final test. Now we're talking the first part of July 1942 at the top secret location near San Diego. Group A, Group B. Group A is given a long message with all punctuation marks you could think of. They sent that in Navajo code to group B, they wrote it down in English. The, the two messages were compared, A and B. But golly, the two messages, they look exactly alike, including punctuation marks. As a matter of fact, they said, it looked like a Xerox copy of the one that was sent. So at this juncture, <clears throat> Thank you. The colonel said, okay, gentlemen, we finish here. Now, we can test this code you just developed and memorize in actual battle to see how your memory works under enemy fire with bombshells falling everywhere. 
and machine guns flying, at, shooting everywhere, maybe four or five inches over your head. See how your memory works in that situation. So we can test this code that you just developed in actual battle. So they sent 14 of the 20, 29 young Navajos. Now we're talking late July 1942. First Marine Division was in Australia, getting ready to go on the first offensive movement in the Pacific. These 14 were sent overseas to join that First Marine Division. August 7, 1942, First Marine Division landed on the beaches of Guadalcanal with 14 Navajo code talkers to test the code in actual battle. So most of them were to land with the first wave. After about three and a half weeks of battle, General Vandegrift, commander of the 1st Marine Division, sent word back to the United States to the Commandant in Washington, D.C. Major Vandegrift, I mean, General Vandegrift said, this Navajo code is tremendous. The enemy never understood it, he said. We didn't understand it either. <laughs> But it works, perfect, it works, so send us some more Navajos. That was the message from General Vandegrift, 1st Marine Division Commander. In August 1942, Navajo code became official United States military code after that test. Thank you. Marine, United States Marine and Navy got together and decide how to use this new code, Navajo code. So they developed a system. They decided there's going to be two communication network. Navajo communication network for all top secret and confidential messages would go through Navajo communication network. The second communication network would be English. All messages that is not top secret or confidential. Messages you don't care if the enemy understands what you're talking about went through the English network. But all messages that is top secret or confidential. Messages you don't want the enemy to know went through Navajo Network. These two communication network work side by side in every landing after Guadalcanal. The next landing after Guadalcanal was Bougainville. These two communication networks everywhere, beach command post, the front line, regimental unit, battalion unit, company units, command ship. The command ship is usually a battleship, a general and admiral that is directing the landing operation is in that command ship, in that command ship, in the communication room, there are two tables. Around one table sits about five or six of us with message pads in front of us and pencil. We have radio headset. The next table, around next table, next to us, 
sits about five or six blonde hair, blue eyed guys. They're handling the English network. Navy signs us runners to stand behind each one of us Navajo code talkers to uh, 24 hours a day until the island is secured. They stand behind us. So when the first shot is fired, all messages start coming in and going out everywhere. Beach command post, the front line, the battalion units, regimental units, different companies all start coming in with messages. These different ships, battleships, cruisers, but destroyers, aircraft carrier, marine air wind, marine tank unit, marine artillery unit, submarines, they all have these two communication network in all of them, including the command ship. So after the first shot is fired, all these messages start coming in, some coming in in Navajo. Those that are coming in in Navajo is labeled New Mexico, Arizona on top. We receive those messages in Navajo. We write it down in English, hand it over our shoulder to the runner that's standing behind us 24 hours a day. He takes it up to the bridge, gives it to the general or the admiral, and they read it, they respond. The runner brings it back down, gives it to us. If he says, Arizona, New Mexico, we send that message back out to where it is intended in Navajo code. But if it does not have Arizona, New Mexico, it goes to the next table. The blonde hair, blue eyed guy sent that message in English. That's how the system worked. Every landing that I just mentioned, Bougainville, Cape Cluster, New Britain, Tarawa, Mekin, Kowajalan, Inuitop, Saipan, Tinian, Guam. I was on Guam, I taught the tail end of the battle there, helped clean up the area, huge jungle area. After Guam, Peleliu a real bad island. We were supposed to take that island in four days, but it was so constructed and fortified that it took over 30 days before the island was secured. First Marine Division on August, uh, September 15, landed on that, on the beaches of Peleliu. 8.30 in the morning, not a cloud in the sky. The temperature on the beach, 100 degrees. At high noon, the temperature went up to 115. In every landing, there's always about a dozen Navajo code talkers to land with the first wave. The first one to face the enemy gunfire that's gonna be coming at you when you land. So they usually assign about a dozen Navajo code talkers to land with the first wave. Why? because the command ship wants to know where the enemy fires are coming from. They give us a map with grid lines and they tell us to memorize that, those grid lines. So when you land with the first wave, they tell us run like hell, hit the deck, and look where the enemy fires are coming from. Look at your map, memorize it, and tell us what area the enemy 
gunfire is coming from. Send that message, that, send that location, Navajo code, back to the command ship. Command ship will then order either a battleship, Marine Air Wing, or one of the cruisers to zero in on that particular enemy gun position. Why do they want that to be communicated in Navajo code? Because the enemy is breaking code. If you to send that message in English code and say where the enemy gun position is located, they know they are being targeted, so they move their gun position to another location. So by the time you get it organized and try to knock that particular enemy gun location, they're gone. But using Navajo code, they don't know they are being targeted, so they continue to stay there and shoot until all of a sudden they get knocked out. That's how Navajo code was used. All troop movements in Navajo code, the enemy doesn't know. Also, when we land, we just land with ammunition that we have in our belt, maybe four or five hand grenades with our radio rifle. That doesn't last very long, the, the bullets or hand grenade. So this, the third or fourth wave, there's a ship that carries ammunition as well as hand grenades. Laying on the beach should dump some more ammunition for us because the one we have doesn't last long. But sometimes they get blown up before they reach the, uh, the, the beach. That means you run out of ammunition. You don't want the enemy to know that, that you, you're out of hand grenades or ammunition. They just walk on on with their rifle and shoot every one of you because I know you can't shoot back. So it was up to Navajo code talkers to send the message back to the command ship that the ammunition ship is blown up. We need some more ammunition. So they load up another ship to bring in ammunition and things that we need. So that's how the code was used in many, many different ways. On Peleliu, 1st Marine Division landed, as I said. And in that landing, there were at least 60 or 70 Navajo code talkers landed on that island to provide the communication network that was needed. A clan cousin of mine who helped me join the United States Marine Corps was killed on that island. He was assigned to land with the first wave. And the radio we used at that time was called TPX. One carried the generator. It weighs about 30 pounds. And the other guy carries receivers and transmission and antenna and wires. So two of you, it takes two of you to operate once one radio, TBX. So this other guy from Shiprock, his name is Jimmy, was with my clan cousin. They're working together with the first wave. He said after they ran about 10 steps away from the landing craft. They hit the deck, but before my clan cousin could hit the deck, a machine gun bullet went across here. His head fell off. 
bloods were gushing out of his neck. His head <clears throat> rolled back toward the water. Over a dozen Navajo code talkers throughout the entire war were killed in action. Over two dozen wounded. War is ugly. War is terrible. That's why most of your relatives, people you know who, are, who have served are now serving somewhere overseas carrying rifle are doing a job to prevent to ever have a war within the United States. Thank you. Thank you. We should always say thank you to these young men and women who keep in the ugliness of war away from our beaches because we love this country. We love what it stands for. The freedom, the liberty, and peace that we all enjoy here is very important, and it takes a good understanding to know that what the great Lord has given us here, this is one of the best country in the whole world, United States of America. And we need to, we need to preserve that. That's why we're doing that. That's why many of us were willing to sign, give our life away, saying whatever happens to me, I'm going to defend this country to the death if necessary. So the code talkers, after the code was certified as an official military code, remain top secret. After Palalu, the next big island, Iwo Jima. Three Marine divisions landed on Iwo Jima, and each division had at least 70 or 80 Navajo code talkers. So three division, three times 80, that's over 200 Navajo code talkers on that island to provide the top secret confidential communication on that island. Major Connor with 5th Marine Division, there was 3rd, 4th, and 5th Marine Division landed there. Major Connor with 5th Marine Division made a report to his superior. And in that report, he said, the first 48 hours of the landing his company had eight Navajo code talkers in that company out of this 200 that I'm talking about. Eight of them was in his company. That eight communicated over 800 messages the first 48 hours. Well, there are two other Marine divisions third and fourth. They all have Navajo code talkers, the same amount as the 5th Marine Division that Major Connor is talking about. So you multiply 800 messages in 48 hours by three. You get over 2,000 Navajo messages 
on Iwo Jima the first 48 hours. If you do little myth, that means Navajo code going through the air every minute nonstop for 48 hours. That's why Major Connor also said in his report that without Navajo, Marines would never have taken the island of Iwo Jima. What a feat, what a success. Following that, other reports by major officers and generals, even admirals say that Navajo Code saved hundreds of thousands of lives in the Pacific as well as helped shorten the war. All of that, what I'm telling you, most of it is now preserved in the Marine Corps archive in Washington, D.C. So if you're ever in Washington, D.C., go to the Marine Corps archive and look for the Major Connors report. Also, on Iwo Jima, there was an actual message that was sent by a 5th Marine Division Navajo code talker who was assigned to this one company. You know, the island of Iwo Jima down on the south end is Mount Surabachi. 3rd Marine Division was down there. In the middle, there's an airstrip, 4th Marine Division. On the north side, there's some little hills and the 5th Marine Division on the north side. Well, this company with the 5th, 5th Marine Division was pinned down real badly. Enemies were shooting at them from the front, from the side, from the back. Also, they were dropping motor shells on them. So this company, Marines, were desperately hanging to their life in their foxhole, can't move. The company commander scribbled a message to send that message back to the beach command post asking for help. He handed that message to a Navajo code talker assigned to that company. This Navajo code talker then sent that message, dialed the beach command post. Beach command post usually have about five or six Navajo code talkers receiving and sending messages. So he got hold of one of them and sent this message asking for help. What did he say in Navajos? Well, I, I tell you, this is the actual message that was sent. A copy of this message that was sent. They, the commander saved those messages. And that message, copy of that message is a Marine Corps archive in Washington, D.C. Anyway, this Navajo code talker with 5th Marine Division company that was in trouble sent this message. This is what he said in Navajo. If there are Navajos in the audience, you understand what I said. What I said in Navajo is this code talker, what he said in Navajo asking for help was sheep, eyes, nose, deer, destroyer, turkey, onion, tea, mouse, turkey, onion, sick horse, three, six, two, bear. Does that sound like asking for help? <laughs> So, Navajo Code Talker at the Beach Command Post received that particular message in Navajo Code. What did he write down? Sheep, eyes, nose, deer? No. He wrote down, send 
demolition team to Hill 362B. That was the message. On the north side, there are three little hills, 362A, 362B, 362C. Beneath 362B was the problem. This message in Navajo Code took 20 seconds. After 20 seconds, Beach Command Post commander organized a rescue team to save that company of Marines. They sent tanks with flamethrowers and other heavy units out there to Hill 362B and save that company. That's why Marines and Navy all say Navajo Code saved hundreds of thousands of lives. If you had sent that same message in English code, 30 minutes, unbelievable. 20 seconds for Nav in Navajo code. And if you were to send that in English code, 30 minutes. The big difference, Navajo code is all voice. English code. Somebody gives you a message, they said that's top secret. You don't want the enemy to know it. So what do you do? We carry another unit called scrambling machine. You turn on your scrambling machine and you take the first letter of that message you are asked to send. The first letter, feed it into your scrambling machine, press a button, then go to the second letter of that message. Take it, feed it into your scrambling machine, press another button, one letter at a time, all through the message. And when you finish, you press the big button, and now comes the message scramble. Scramble messages came in groups of five letters, like KZTIO, another group of five letters. That's the one you sent to the English network guy. He writes it down in scramble form. He then turns on his de-scrambling machine, takes the first letter of that scramble message, feed it into his de-scrambling machine, presses a button, go to the second letter, feed it into his de-scrambling machine, press another button, all the way through until he finishes it, presses a big button, and hopefully now the message comes out as it was sent. Well, sometimes you press the wrong button, so the message is not all there. 20 seconds in Navajo code, 20, 30 minutes English code. Tremendous difference. Those guys didn't have 30 minutes. After 20 seconds, using Navajo code, they receive help they needed. That's why they say Navajo code saved hundreds of thousands of lives in the Pacific. It was the only military code they tell us never broken by an enemy. They captured a Navajo on Philippines. This Navajo was with General MacArthur's army. He's not a code talker, but he was a Navajo. The Japanese knew that the codes that were being developed was Navajo. So they captured this Navajo, took him to Tokyo to come before the military, Japanese military code experts. And they played the, they tape our messages. So they played the messages for him to interpret. What are they saying? Oh, they're saying sick horse and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so what are they, what a Japanese expert do? They punish this poor Navajo, whip him, short of killing him. So he could break and actually they think that he's, hiding what we were actually saying. No, he wasn't hiding, he's actually telling them exactly what we're saying. But it doesn't make sense at all. So, two years 
they tried to get him to break. But he, he didn't need to break. He was telling them the truth. Then that's why the Japanese never could break the code. They tell us Navajo code is the only military code in modern history never broken by an enemy. Well, after Iwo Jima, the next was Okinawa. After Okinawa, the next big landing was scheduled November 1st, the mean island of Japan. Some of us were then transferred to land with that group on November 1st on the mean island of Japan. That would be the last landing and they projected there would be over a million casualties because the Japanese would not give up until they all die. But 60 days before that landing on November 1st, two bombs were dropped, one on Nagasaki, one on Hiroshima wipe out these two major cities with one bomb, atomic bomb, kill hundreds of thousands. On August 14, the emperor of Japan telephoned the White House. August 14, 1945, saying, we quit, we don't want to fight no more. So, according to military history, August 14 is the official day of ending of World War II. And of course, there was close to a million Japanese in Manchuria. They said, we're not gonna quit. Emperor, you may have quit, but we're going to continue to fight. So they sent 1st Marine Division and 6th Marine Division to North China. I was transferred into 6th Marine Division and landed on in China, Tsingtao, China. 1st Marine Division landed in Tsing. Our job to get those close to a million Japanese to surrender. They eventually did in October. October 25, 1945, we had a separate peace treaty ceremony in Tsingtao, China. We had a long table. All the Japanese officers, generals, brought all their units in. They brought in all their tanks, artillery, all weapons that they had into a huge pile, turning everything. They signed a peace treaty, October 25, 1945. And the rest of them, uh, the Japanese, were then put on boats to ship them back to Japan. That's how Navajo code was used, and the last time it was used was in China. And because the code was so good, they told us upon discharge, don't tell anybody what you did, because what you did is top secret. You wait until it's declassified. Your code has actually became official United States military code. So you wait until it's declassified. You'll read it in a newspaper or come on the radio. They tell us, if people ask you what you did in war, just tell them you were a radio man, that's all. So when we got home, sure enough, our relatives friends say, hey, what did you do in war? Our answer, they told us, the only answer we could give was, I was a radio man. That's it. 
So when we got home, we asked question. They were asking us question. We say, oh, I was such a radio man. Don't ask me any more question. We waited for the Navajo code to be declassified. One year, three years, five years, nothing. So we just eventually forgot about it. We all did our own thing. Some went back to Navajo life. Some of them went on to find jobs. Some of them went on using their GI Bill to get an education. Well, it wasn't until 1968, 23 years later, we saw it on newspaper, television, and radio that Navajo Code was declassified. And everybody just look at each other, so what? You know, we put it away, we forgot about it. And, but media start coming around. I said, what's this Navajo Code? Can you tell us about it? Well, we finally got organized and start talking about it. Out of the 400 that served, there's only three of us still alive. John Kinsel from Lukachuka, he's over 100 years old, confined to his bed. Also, Thomas Piquet from south of Gallup. He's about 97 years old. He still can get around, even at 97. And the youngest of the three of us is me, 94 years old. I'm the, I'm the youngest because I went in when I was 15 years old. A friend and cousin of mine that helped me join at age 15, as I said, was killed on the beach of Palalu. That's sort of the story of Navajo Code Talkers. So today, the three of us still working. What are we working on? We still say to each other, we go one more mission to complete and everything will be finished. That one mission is to create and establish Navajo National Code Talker Museum. That's what we're working on. And we need your help because it's going to cost quite a, a big chunk of money. So we need donors. If you know some people who have money in their foundation or what have you, or your rich uncle, <laughs> tell them we have a, a mission, one more mission to finish off World War II. That is to build this national Navajo Code Talker Museum. Why? Because this museum we're building is not going to be an ordinary museum. It's going to be a museum that has a lot of high tech in it. Also, a museum that's going to tell a story. Not, you're not just going to go in there and look at the radio we use or some typical messages we send. They'll be there. But the big thing about this museum that we're working on is it's an active, very productive. Your children, Navajo children, America's children can go right through the museum and really learn what diversity means in America. You know America is comprised of a diverse community. We have different nationalities, we have different languages, we have all kinds of different skills and talents in America. Diverse community. And one of those diverse community was Navajo. 
the language was used to have win the war in the Pacific. All these different nationalities, all these different talents that we have in America as a diverse community is very important. And we want to highlight that through Navajo culture, through Navajo beliefs, and through what Navajos did. Using that as lecture, you go from one room, a lecture this, a lecture on this particular island, how it, it was one, another island, and how it was developed, how it was used, and how many were uh, saved, and how many were Navajo code talks killed. But the big things you're going to see in that museum is using Navajo culture, Navajo language, Navajo belief as a lens that you look through, you will be able to see more clearly what it means to be an American, the greatest nation the Lord has ever given to the world. That's what this museum is going to represent, your museum. You'll send snowflake kids through that museum, and they'll come out knowing, oh, my God, I am an American, and I'm proud. And today, from now on, from this day forward, by golly, I'm going to pitch in to save the freedom and the liberty and the peace that, that we all enjoy. That's what this museum is going to provide. That's why I said it's, it's going to be a lot different than most museums that you go through. I've been to World War II Museum, New Orleans. It's a big one. It's, it's not. It tells the story. But our museum is going to be much different. Our museum, as I said, is geared so that no matter who you are in America, if you walk through there, you will walk out of there and say, oh, my God, how I am important to this country. I want to preserve. I want to contribute. I want to help. I want to save what we have. I want to save what the Lord has blessed us with. That's what you can come out with at the other end. That's what we're working on. And today, tonight, I have a postcard here that talks about Peter McDonald, how I joined the United States Marine at age 15, and also what my educational history, work history is here. I have quite a few of these for all of you. And also, I have a book here. There's quite a few books out there on Navajo Code Talkers, over a dozen books. But this one I like, it's called Navajo Weapon. I don't like it because, I like it not because the guy you see on the front is my cousin, James Nakai. But the big thing I like about this, it tells you quite a bit on different battles that were fought throughout the entire Pacific War. A lot more detail in here. But the most important thing I like about this book is down toward the end of the book, there are several pages of Navajo code words that we develop are all in here. Like all the words for the letters of the English alphabet, code words for different things, different ships, different military equipment. We even changed the word Navajo word to something else 
like the word hill. Navajo word for hill is Tahiskit, a hill. But we know if the Japanese captured a Navajo that is not Navajo Koto, and here I say Tahiskit, he'll tell the Japanese they're saying hill. So we created a new word for hill. The new word, code word for hill was Hidatsa, sick horse. Why sick horse? Because the code word for letter H is C horse. And I-L-L -L is what? Sick, you don't feel good. So we've combined those two, the letter H and I-L-L -L together and say Tlidatsa, which to us code talkers, when you hear Tlidatsa, you write down H-I-L-L, -L, hill. Same way with other words, like that, the word that, T-H-A-T. We say Taji Bicha. Taji in Navajo means turkey's hat. The code word for the letter T is Turkey, Tanji. H A T is a hat. You combine these two, make it that. So many of the code words were designed like that. That's why no one who had not gone through that school, the code talker school, memorized these, would never understand what in the world we are saying. That's in here. So, uh, this is for sale. And uh, if you buy these books, I suggest you turn to uh, the code section and send me an email. Use the Navajo code words. <laughs> All these scammers said, get into your email and learn what you're talking about. We'll have no idea what you and I are talking about. And my email address is in here. <clears throat> Thank you very much for listening and for uh, a great audience that you are. And I want to thank all of you for asking me to be here, my wife Wanda, and my the youngest daughter Charity are here. She can take care of you with these, and also if you want to buy the book, you could uh, deal with her. And uh, again, thank you all Native Americans who are here. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Wow. Wow, I appreciate all of you attending. Um, this is wonderful. And I thank him for his service. I think we all want to, and every veteran, you know, that is out there. We appreciate what you are still doing out there and what you've done. Um, there, his dream of having this museum, I hope and pray it does come true. And here's a little token for our appreciation for coming, Mr. McDonald. Um, he will be out in the lobby area with his book, and he does have these postcards, but he is gonna be out there with them if you are interested in uh, purchasing them, okay? Pictures. And pictures as well. Thank you. Okay. The postcards are free. The book is $40, either cash or credit. But he will be out there in the lobby as soon as we can get him out there. Thank you. Well,